Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. In the waning days of the, well, I guess I'll call it 2020 dash 2021 season for many of us. Still going strong out here in the West. In fact, uh, hoping to close my season in uh, the friendly state of Nevada where they add a week of February to their chucker and quail season. Thank you, everybody in the Silver State for that. I'm not rubbing it in. I'm just making you aware of what I hope to do in the next few weeks. Uh, hope you're out there doing the same thing. You're going to learn more about all of that real soon. What you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're hoping for. Got a listener on the line. We're going to play 10 questions. Yeah, I don't want to bore you with 20, but we're going to play 10. That's the whole idea. Any topic related to bird hunting and bird dogs, as well as your hunting reports. I'll give you a little bit of a summary of my last couple trips. I did a poll recently, the Upland Nation Index Survey, and asked you a whole bunch of questions. If you responded, thank you. You're entered in the random drawing for a Mossberg over and under silver reserve shotgun already handed out one gonna pick two more winners clearing out my gun safe they're brand new in the box and um, believe me if you're looking for an over and under this is a great opportunity all right so um a handle it segment this week we'll answer a listener question we'll also deal with a public access tip and a whole bunch of other things in that realm because man it's all about hunting this time of year and i hope you're getting out and doing it it's been fun we um just last night i'm instituting what i hope to be a fairly regular tradition around here um with appropriate social distancing and the right amount of liquid lubrication if you know what i mean having a campfire in the backyard with hunting buddies uh one or two at a time uh yeah we're sterilizing ourselves from the inside and uh, also socially distancing but we're getting to talk about all the stuff we like to do and you know hunting is in a lot of ways, a, a solitary game. So when do we do all this? Well, we do it on social media. Yeah, I get it. But the real meat of the matter comes down to face-to-face -to -face contact with guys you like, women you like, uh, you know, what, whoever your, your hunting friends are, sharing those stories and elaborating on them, uh, most of them being true, but not all of them. And that's okay, too, because that's part of the story. Yeah, making up stories is part of the story. Um, this one, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. I was out, I got one day of good weather last week, and I got out to a place that I, you know, I violate my own rule of never going back to the same place twice. I do this for one spot because I like the guy who manages this wildlife area, and I also like the fact that it's relatively close. I had one good day, got out there, and uh, pretty much got skunked. All the usual spots did not pay off, but it was still a nice walk, easy hunt, just one day. And I did go to the, the last spot where I always see pheasants crossing the road when I'm leaving. Yeah, I see them in the rear view mirror as they're flying across. I think they're flipping me off as they fly. Anyway, we did get one surprise wild flush on a hen pheasant, so I've got hope for next season. And while we were unpacking, or packing up, I guess, um, an old buddy from a committee I was on at the state level a few years back drove past, and he had been there all weekend doing some duck hunting. And so it was good to see him. It had been a long time since I saw him and uh, got a few tips on some other spots. So it was a worthwhile trip no matter what. And I did get some exercise, and so did Flick. So there we go. Looking forward to a couple trips to um, new places with old friends and new friends both in the next week or so. Maybe you're doing the same thing. If you are, good luck. Be safe. Take a newcomer and uh, be good to your dog. All right. So um, that was my story. Sorry, I don't have anything more exciting. But uh, on Facebook every week, I ask you how your hunts are going. And congratulations, Cole Mulch. Lots of learning going on in Bramble's first season, he says. Yeah, but it looks good. That's a steady looking. Um, I'm going to guess it's a short hair from that distance, but great photo. 
Uh, the learning, by the way, is both Bramble and Cole, uh, and I'm glad to see that. Uh, you know, I wrote a whole, do- a whole book on the subject of what dogs can teach us, and, you know, if we remember nothing else, that's something really important. Scott Fuller sends a picture of uh, a beautiful wire hair with an incredible backdrop. Scott, I wonder if I've been there. If I haven't, I've been to places like that. Uh, just for everybody else, go to the Facebook page and look at all this stuff. It's The headline is Monday Morning Debrief. But uh, it's a it, it looks like one of those classic Monument Valley uh, Western movie. Uh, who, we call them hoodoos out here, those rocky uh, pillars and things like that. It's not as big as Monument Valley, but uh, I bet you didn't need an Indian permit to get that picture, Scott like you do at Monument Valley. Good looking shot. Um, Karen Foote, uh, uh, right, ironically or something, with tongue in cheek sends a picture of snow with what I think are pheasant tracks in it. Get it, Karen Foote? Beautiful. Took some of those myself last week at that spot I was just telling you about. That's as close as I got to a bird besides for that. That hand, Kevin McLaughlin showing off a nice stack of birds uh, with a a good-looking dog and a buddy. Yeah, that's the way to do it sometimes. Kyle Stein, how'd you get that short hair to hold still? Maybe she was, well, maybe it's a he, I can't tell, but intrigued by the the dead ring neck next to your dog. Beautiful. Dan Lenson has a great shot of four Labradors on a tailgate and three ring necks on a tailgate. Yeah, that's a pretty good ratio. I'll take that any day, Dan. So uh, good for you. And by the way, all three flavors of Labradors there. It's been a couple of years since I got to do that over in South Dakota, but uh, always fun to, to hunt with a brown, a yellow, and a black at the same time, even if it's a cluster, if you know what I mean. Brad Fleming's got a shot of a dark colored short hair, I think it is, in the snow. You know, I got to apologize. If you don't know it yet, uh, you know it now. I am slightly colorblind. So when you say brown, I look at that tree and I see green, or you say green and I look at the tree and see brown. So same with dogs. Celia Rausch, beautiful shot, some nice quail. And another good-looking uh, wire hair there, beautiful. And it looks like the desert. Hope to be out there real soon, in fact, looking at that. And congratulations one more time, Matt Templeton. You sent us a video of your dog's first water retrieve. That is a milestone, and I am so happy for you. So, hey, everybody out there, if you are um, if you are having a good time out in the woods or in the prairies or wherever it is, uh, the Monday Morning Debrief is a place to brag about it, share your uh, adventures, show off your dogs, and um, also hopefully uh, take a great picture that we can all admire. Uh, it's all about the beauty out there, and that's one way to do it. So keep up the good work, and let's keep talking even after the season dwindles to a close, which happens sooner than later. Yeah, 10 questions coming up on the docket very soon. Got a listener on the line. We're going to play that game and see uh, see if I can answer any of them in a way that makes any sense. So stick around for that. In the meanwhile, a quick reminder, Sage and Breaker gun care products are crafted at the highest caliber, and they've been with us for a long time here. There's some New Year products out there, New Year and new products. Oh, what a coincidence, Hey, That's how it works over there at sageandbreaker.com, and that's sageandbreaker.com. Always free shipping. Their gun grease is one of the you know, items that I am now keeping handy. I've got a truck vault, and there's a drawer in there where the guns go, the gloves go, the whistles go, and all the other stuff I need to do before I actually walk away from the truck. It's all right there, including Sage and Breaker products. Gun grease, their CLP is right there for uh, after the hunt, the boar snake. It's all right there. Learn more about all of the stuff they have that will help you keep your gun in functional complete and beautiful order at sageandbreaker.com yeah so here we are 10 questions 
Kind of like 20 questions, but half as long. Hopefully not near as boring as a result of that. I'm sure that the questions won't be boring. The answer for me might be, but we'll find out about that. We're talking to Pennsylvania, the United States of America, and Wayne Harvat. Welcome to the program, Wayne. Oh, thank you very much, Scott. Glad to be here. It's good to talk with somebody else who shares some of the passion that we have here. Tell me, um, you know, in a perfect world, uh, besides talking to me, which is probably the highlight of your, maybe your life for that matter, uh, <laughs> what do you love to do in our world? Uh, the main thing I love to do is upland bird hunt. Um, my wife and I, uh, we share a passion for that. Uh, we have a small kennel, uh, Laurel Furnace Bretons, here in Pennsylvania, uh, where you know we raise French Brittanies and do most of the training ourselves. Um, we do have a trainer that helps us out because I'm not, you know, the pro, pro trainer by any means. But um, yeah, that that's pretty much it. And we travel around with those dogs and hunt whenever or wherever we can. What, what if you had to narrow it down to a species what, uh, being in Pennsylvania I might guess what the answer is but you tell us what birds would you chase if you could only chase one or two types uh you know what in Pennsylvania grouse numbers um from years ago they're so low right now that um a lot of guys aren't hunting them pressuring them too much just because the numbers are so low mm -hmm. and contacts are so infrequent but pennsylvania does have a very good pheasant stocking program um that runs pretty much the end of october through uh uh christmas eve uh that you know gives us the opportunity to go out and hunt some stocked pheasants and it's a real good program i mean they put a good amount of birds out and it's a pretty good time and also uh during about the Next to the last week in October through the middle of November, uh, we get a pretty good woodcock flight as well here in Pennsylvania. Nice. You know, it's funny, and just you know, for for the rest of us, because if if you're a, a fan of the history of our sport, you know that if, a, a while back, uh, I, I'm trying not to say in the good old days very frequently anymore, but back in the day, uh, peasant, Pennsylvania had an incredible pheasant a wild pheasant uh, population and in it and at times probably the largest number of pheasant hunters in any given state whether it's the the stock variety or the wild variety you know we a lot of us think of uh, Pennsylvania and my limited experience in that state is is that it's it's mainly some sort of forest if you will and you talked about roughies and you talked about woodcock where are the pheasants in all of that well the pheasants uh the wild populations i would say pretty much all but ended uh by the early 80s um the pennsylvania game commission has tried a couple of wild pheasant restoration areas that's not really gone that well um you know, the areas they were found in most commonly in Pennsylvania are the southern part, which is more farmland, of course. Mm. And, um, but yeah, their attempt, they were doing that for about 10 years, um, uh, late 90s into the beginning of 2000. And just on those ideal habitats, they still weren't having any luck with trying to get the population restored to some wild birds. So pretty much down to the put and take birds now yeah well you know you you bring up the the point that it, it's true everywhere uh even in the pheasant hotbeds the dakotas and in, in you know montana and and places like that if there's no farmland there's no pheasants um it, it just there they go hand in hand and i would imagine farmland in pennsylvania is a uh a dwindling resource as well oh, great yeah it definitely is and it's not like um, the states you're talking about, yeah. Iowa or yeah. South Dakota, where they have the CRP programs and all that. Mm -hmm. there, there's really nothing like that here. It's all about the almighty dollar. It's, I mean, and you guys went through yet another oil boom recently, too, just like the Bakken over there in the Dakotas. Uh, so I would imagine even that has an effect uh, on the 
the motivation for trying to do something for wildlife such as it is. Right. Yeah. I agreed with that. That it just um created more bare land, I guess. Yeah. Is, yeah. is what it was. Well, tell me about your dogs. Uh, as you know, and 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 many people know, I've done a few television shows about Epignol Breton. I think that's how you're supposed to say it, but you yes. t- you tell me. Um, no, and we share some friends in that world. Uh, to, uh, here's your chance to brag a little bit about a, a fairly rare breed here in the States. Okay, yeah, the Epignol Breton, or French Brittany, as it's known, um, is basically the original uh Brittany that came from France, um, generally a uh, little smaller and shorter than the American Brittany and cobbier, um, closer, a little bit closer working dog than the American Brittany is, a um, lot of fun, high energy, um, just great personalities, uh, great in the house as well with kids. Um, yeah, at our kennel, that's we sort of strive for that all around dog. Um, that's not only good in the field, but it's good when it comes home with you. So, um, you, you know, one of the other differences, yeah. Uh, when I, I actually wrote a story for gun dog magazine, made the cover in fact for gun dog magazine a while back. The, the, the first thing that struck me is how often those dogs are differently colored than, um, say the American, if we call it the American Brittany, um, describe some of your dogs. Are they are they some of those tricolor or lots of black or you know, what do you got out there? Yeah. Um, well, of the five dogs we have right now, um, four of them are the typical orange and white Brittany. You know that most people mm-hmm. are familiar with and would see. And then we do have a tricolor female um, who is uh, black, orange, and white, and um, yeah, the Britneys come um, with the French Britneys. You can get them in that number of tricolors. There's um, uh, liver white and black. Um, there's also, of course, the orange and white. And then the tricolor, like we have the uh, black, orange, and white. So uh, unlike the American Britney, there's there's more color variation in it that's accepted. I love it, and and it's always fun to work with those dogs. If you had to narrow it down to one thing, what do you love most about the Epignol Breton? Spunk. <laughs> we'll, we'll love their spunk. They are a fun dog. They are, uh, no doubt about it. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, our mutual friend Jackie, and mm-hmm. we're, we're shooting some preliminary footage before we started off on the first day, and every one of the dogs he let out of the box spun around – and then jumped into his arms. And I, oh, wow. <laughs> I, 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 the, typically, the cockers we, we use on the TV show will do that. I mean, it's almost a guaranteed thing. We set up for that because we know it'll happen. But I've never seen it with Britneys of any sort before. And, and it's just, a, they, they are so full of joy. They just, especially when they're just let out of the box, they, they know what's going to happen next. And they're, they're pretty darn happy about it, aren't they? Yes, they are. <laughs> Uh, uh, hey everybody you're listening to the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden your host that's wayne harvat from pennsylvania uh epignol breton uh owner slash breeder and um he's got 10 questions for me that hopefully we might be able to cobble together answers for um and it's probably about time to start on that wayne where do you want to start what's your first question to me okay um you know when i started putting these questions together i consulted with a couple of friends of mine who are pretty experienced in the process so i'm in big Uh, trouble (laughs) (laughs) well no we we decided we wanted to keep it simple you know for (laughs) the average bird hunter out there but um especially this time of year uh with christmas and new year's a lot of people getting new puppies yeah um so um the first like three or four questions I uh, came up with in conjunction with a good friend of mine, um, uh, Rich Curlin from Curlin's Canine Training uh, here in Pennsylvania. And the first question is, how do you recommend introducing noise and gunfire 
to a young dog. Yeah, thanks. And and Rich, by the way, I'm not a uh, I'm not a pro trainer. You probably have better ideas than me. And and I'm going to get you for this one because it is, pardon the pun, a loaded question. <laughs> and, and Wayne, you have your own thoughts on this, and we'll talk about it. But uh, um, it's, it's funny because I get a question like that. Besides the Besides, where can I get a dog just like yours? Um, I, I get the gunfire uh, introduction question a lot, and, and 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 it goes way back. And and I hope I'm helping a lot of people with this. And I dealt with it uh, briefly, uh, maybe a two or three podcasts ago, and then also on the Facebook page. Um, everything you do when you're introducing any kind of stimuli to uh to a puppy you do in baby steps gradually and um i'll I'll describe it as from a distance um and and you know and a lot of breeders have uh the the rule of seven or some of them go so far as the rule of 12 so over the course of a puppy's life from when their eyes open till when they go home with their uh permanent owners the puppies are introduced to all sorts of unusual or um new new things you know some people put their pups on seven different kinds of flooring and they eat out of seven different bowls um noise of all sorts the same way all the 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 noise in particular you introduce from far away and then you bring it closer there are a lot of folks who will introduce gunfire by taking their dog to the trap club and and walking them closer to the shooters uh, and that's the last thing i think i would want to do I, and, and it works for some people i mean i got some feedback on that and they said well that's how i did my dog's fine okay i get it but if you want to ensure because th- here's here's the problem gun shyness is really hard to fix so if you want to play it safe that's probably not the best way to do it right. um, loud noises um again uh uh you know whether it's banging on pots and pans or anything else um sure go ahead but do it from a distance and you know watch your dog carefully to see how that dog reacts so you know ideally you have help with that so we're doing that with all sorts of noises um, but when it comes to gunfire here are the things that are important to to me at least that i've seen work in virtually every case um First off, the dog's got to be bold, got to be confident, can still be young. That's not the issue, but bold and confident. So uh, if you're not watching your dog closely enough to to know that your dog is ready for that, then you might want to be careful. Second off, virtually all the time, the best way to introduce gunfire of any sort is by associating it with the fun of bird contact. Agreed. Everybody from Rick and Ronnie Smith on down says my dogs don't hear a gunshot until they're chasing after a bird that they found. Notice I'm not saying they're pointing a bird or they're you know anything else, but they they are fired. Pardon the pun. Fired up about bird contact. Um, and I hear that or variations on that from all sorts of folks, from my own veterinarian to Rick and Ronnie and every other trainer that I I respect. So uh, the first thing you've got to do is have birds. Um, you can introduce those birds in various ways, and it depends, again, on the dog. But you start with a dog and a bird contact and somebody with a, you know, a cap gun way off in the distance. I, I found a toy gun, a toy shotgun, if you will, that just makes a little electronic bang, and that even works better. But, you know, whatever you're starting with, start way far away and let that bird be dealing with um, let that dog be dealing with a bird eventually you move closer and closer while that dog is having fun with the birds and it could be you know chase one catch it mouth it you know tear it apart you know whatever your philosophy is about that stuff way far away moving closer then do it again with a you know a 22 blank way far away and closer then with a 410 and then with a 20 gate it's so on and so forth but far away watching the dog closer watching the dog etc cetera, etc cetera. and hopefully that dog puts two and two together birds gunfire a good time for me Whew. yep what do you no, think couldn't <laughs> you. no couldn't agree with you more on that scott that's exactly how we introduce all of our dogs to 
gunfire. Yeah. Birds are the key element. And and you know I I, I said you know chasing a bird, but uh, you know we've done it with uh, young dogs. Uh, that are just they're dead birds you know and it's then the pop gun is way off in the distance but they're playing around with they're carrying a dead bird or whatever you know it's different for every dog but they're you know as long as they understand the connection um how do you do it i mean beyond that do you use dead birds or do you wait until you have live birds and you're planted in the field and that sort of thing uh generally i always try and use live birds yeah um i I think it gets that enthusiasm level up to the next level that they're so focused on that bird that that gunshot is almost irrelevant at that point yeah absolutely true okay well i hope we covered that in way more detail than i meant to but uh but that one is a that's a critical one i'm glad we started with that because like i said there are so many people who just take the puppy down to the skeet a field and uh, cross their fingers yeah that makes me cringe sometimes oh i, <laughs> I have friends i know and, and those of you who wrote in on that before uh you're you're damn lucky okay all right question number two ten questions we're down to nine more here at the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden that's wayne harvat wayne what's next uh number two is how do you introduce your dog to the e-collar yeah um uh, you know i gotta i I qualify that because i'm it it evolves over time um i'm really liking uh maybe you heard it you know i had on the podcast a while back i had uh, one of the monks of new skeet and they collaborated with a professional writer on a new book on how to deal how to train dogs and i I really like their attitude and they are using uh, e-collars totally differently than most people ever did um i'm not a psychologist i'm not an animal behaviorist but uh but um but the the electronic collar in my estimation uh has uh, several roles especially if you have one that's slightly versatile um with a a beep or a vibrator i think they call it a tone in some manufacturers Mm -hmm. so you it, it can make noise of various types it can vibrate or it can shock okay and we all know it's not really a shock if you don't know what it feels like you you should do that the first time you take it out of the box and charge it set it on one and put it on your wrist and see what it feels like it's like a static uh like static electricity um i'm liking the idea of using an e-collar primarily for this to interrupt a dog's train of thought when he's considering doing something you don't want him to do um, as opposed to punishment and and there is a place for that and there was a place yesterday for it and i'll tell you that in a minute if i don't forget but most dogs can be head off at the pass as it were before they violate one of your primary rules whatever they are and and that's the first thing of course a dog can't be expected to follow a command if he doesn't know the command inside and out so the first thing you got to do is teach that command in the yard on a checkboard on a leash or in other controlled ways so that the dog when you say here that dog knows it means come to the boss immediately do not pass go do not collect 200 kibbles so so that's number one uh the command must be known mastered in every other context beyond before the collar goes on Uh, the collar um is the chance for you to exercise what i continually remind people of and 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 again uh, i'm not bragging but i called my book what the dogs taught me for a reason i think you can learn a hell of a lot about what a dog is doing and thinking by just paying attention uh so if you're if you're hunting or training and and your total attention is not on your dog you're probably going to screw up you're a bad owner okay i said it um watch the dog when the dog's about ready to break the rule do something you don't want him to do hit that collar control now set it very low so that all it does is it pops him upside the head you know like your mom used to do with her finger you know um and says hold it hey 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 i'm watching you 
And you can also do that by just watching even without using a collar. I, uh, you know, I talk a lot of times about what it uh, it tells, just like a poker player. So you watch a dog and he's on point and you want him to stay on point and you tell him that word W-H-O-A and he's, he's, he's quivering and then he starts kind of leaning back on his haunches. We know what's going to happen next. Wayne, what is going to happen next? He's going to pounce. Yes, he is. That's when we hit the collar. Now, that may not be the way you train for that dog, for that situation, but whatever it is, if the dog has a tell and you know your dog, you're going to figure it out. Okay, so so it's, it's a, it is a pop upside the head to say, uh, don't even think about that. Follow my direction. And I'm using that a lot. And that's what uh, Brother Christopher, one of the monks of New Skeet, uh, is big on now. They're using a, an e-collar as as a way to say, hey, I don't care if you're you know, three feet or 300 feet from me. I'm, I still have a little reminder here. And we joke about it. We call it a thousand-yard check cord or whatever. But it, all of those things matter. Now, there are cases, at least I think there are, um, when you can use that uh, for good as an aversion tool. We want a dog to not do certain things, certain things that are life-threatening. Um, and, you know, rattlesnake breaking is a perfect example of that. Out here, it's porcupines, it's mountain lions, it's uh, raccoons, and it's, uh, you know, all sorts of other critters. Uh, and just yesterday, um, while Flick is learning every day, once in a while, he forgets that he's not supposed to chase mule deer. And oh. our backyard is the start of a massive mule deer winter range and there just happened to be so many in the same spot so close to him he thought it, he thought that would be a fun diversion <laughs> for a moment and that's when you're grateful for that rise capability on your on your collar so that you can say oh here's the reminder Bleep. and here is the reminder ah! For yeah. those extra tempting okay. moments. So, the, so those, uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's how it is. And so, uh, and I, I didn't talk about collar conditioning because that's pretty simple. You just put it on the dog, and you, you don't even carry the transmitter. The dog gets used to it, and then the, the corollary to that is collar-wise dogs who only obey when the collar's on them. I leave the collar on all the time. I mean, I leave the collar on the dog all the time when we're in the field. It's not turned on all the time. But anyway, there you go. How's that help, Wayne? No, that's that's perfect. I agree. And you actually touched on one of the other questions I had when you were talking about reading your dog. Yeah. Um, you, You know, a lot of people read, what does it mean to read your dog in the field? And how does that help you? Yeah, I, I did a video on that. I'll try and dig it up and, and put it on the Facebook page all about, uh, again, what I call tells. Uh, mm-hmm. A dog is ready to take a command at certain points and absolutely the opposite, very unready to take commands at other times. And we know what those are. Uh, you know, you could yell your, and, and people, we're all guilty of it too. That dog has already flushed the birds and he is off like a bat out of hell trying to catch them all. Uh, that's not the time to say, whoa, because you're just wasting your breath and the dog is learning, uh, that he can disobey. So good. All right. So I guess we're probably on to question number seven. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) As a result. (laughs) Yeah. Pretty close. Pretty close. Um, if you're ready for another one, I can certainly give it to you. Um, uh, what are your, some of your thoughts and tips and some of the rest of these questions um, came with another friend of mine, Paul Mann. Um, he's a guide and trainer at Forbes Road Hunting Club here. And um, his questions are, are a little different, more to do with um, what, what are your tips and thoughts for the first time out of state hunter? Um, do you recommend oh. getting an outfitter? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good, good question. And, you know, I, uh, I can't see it from here, but I have a map of the United States on the wall in another room. Uh, and there's a little, um, 
little um, post-it notes on all the states I've been to. And uh, and 26 of them have uh, what I'm told are red post-it notes, which means I hunted there. And and I uh, I, I I do have some advice on a first-time traveling hunter. Uh, and you just touched on the best part, and that is um, if you have limited time, and we do all the time. I mean, on, on the TV show, it's, it's, it's critical. Time is money in my world. I pay my guys by the day. So if we're out looking for birds for three days, that that's a bust. Right. Um, a, a good outfitter who knows the country, um, and I'll talk about that too, is worth their weight in uh, your time and money. Um, if you're driving somewhere, you've already made an investment in time. Flying there, there's the investment in time and money, uh, but your time is valuable too. So, uh, you know, it's just smarter to find somebody at least early on in your visit who can help you understand the, the new birds, the new country. Um, I'm not saying you're going to, you know, be able to take your GPS and mark those spots and then go back to them. That would be bad form. Um, and quite often, uh, a pro outfitter of any sort is only going to be hunting on private ground anyway because they want to know it inside and out. And some of the, the guys I work with regularly who I really respect, they're on that ground all year doing something that will lead to the knowledge and the capabilities that they have when you show up on Sunday and you want to find sharp tails. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, search for good guides and outfitters. Uh, ask your friends. Um, it always helps if you can find a um, uh, somebody with an endorsement of various sorts. There are other ways to kind of vet those people. Um, if they've been uh, quoted in magazine articles or their website has a lot of um, you know, recommendations, all good. Find people who are doing it full time and who have been doing it for a while. Uh, there are lots of guys who will guide you on South Dakota pheasants who spend most of the year somewhere else. Uh, I might be careful about that sort of thing but yes use one definitely yeah that that's my thought as well first time going somewhere it, it's always nice to have someone give you the lay of the land at least for the first day or two you know here's a perfect example wayne um i'm passionate about sharp tails i did last week's podcast was all about what i've learned in the last five or seven years about that bird and um but but when you go out with a pro, you also learn the difference between sharp tail habitat and Hungarian partridge habitat. And it's not that big a difference, but it's a crucial difference. And you never learn that unless you go with somebody who already knows it or you have weeks and weeks or years and years to assemble that knowledge by trial and error. So, you know, I encourage everybody to hire a pro guide, uh, do the do the math and you'll realize it's cost effective. Number two, ask all the dumb questions. This guy, he's your tutor for the day. You may, right. as, well, you may as well learn something from him. Yeah. And they're usually more than happy to talk to you about those things. I think so. Yeah. You know, there's a protocol there and, you know, it's certainly not going to get him to tell you his secret spots, but, but everything else is fair game. Right. Uh, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast, where everything is fair game here. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Wayne Harvat is asking me, tw I keep saying 20. God would be here till tomorrow. <laughs> 10 questions and um, uh, having a good time at it. If you want to get involved in this, uh, the Facebook page is always a good place to start. Uh, Wing Shooting USA or Upland Nation, either one. And uh, we'll do this again. So uh, send me a message via those pages, and uh, maybe you'll be the next guy to try and stump me with 10 questions. Wayne, what's next on your list? Okay. Uh, next one I get commonly, and um, my friend Paul does as well, what chokes and shot sizes do you recommend for certain birds? Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of that is, is, is subjective, um, because we're also talking about the gauge of your gun and how many pellets you think you need to get in the air. I remember a guy 
and he said it with a straight face, and I, I think he meant it. He said, I always, I always shoot three and a half inch 10 gauge so that I can put as many pellets in the air as possible. And I thought, okay, that's, wow. that's great. Okay. But, um, <laughs> you know, and then we know the other guys who think they're so good that they only need to put one pellet in there. So they're always shooting a 28 gauge, no matter what. And most of us fall in between, but you know, a I'm a bad shooter. Uh, so I shoot improved and modified jokes almost all the time. I shoot a 20 gauge almost all the time. And, and then from there, it's pretty simple. Uh, but I only shoot birds at 25, 30 yards, unless it's just a fluke, an accident. Uh, so, so almost anything works at 30 yards. I've killed, uh, pheasants with number eights. Um, I've missed, uh, quail with number fives. So beyond all that, if, if you're, you know, generally speaking, a bigger shot for bigger birds, smaller shot for smaller birds, uh, quail, I shoot seven and a halfs almost all the time. I'll shoot seven and a halfs on huns. I'll shoot sixes on chuckers and I'll go to sixes or fives on pheasants and, um, then I just am kind of judicious about my shot selection after that. So um, it's it's really a matter of how much practice you can get in and how confident you are in yourself, in your gun, and then in the ammo you're using. Agreed. Yeah, that's what th- I'm part of that club who uh, just recently got a new 28 gauge. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, I, I love my 28s. Uh, I don't use them very often because I, I don't practice with them enough. And that's one of my promises, again, for this off season but uh um you know the shot comes out of the out of the muzzle at the same speed as it does out of a 12 gauge well your plus or minus you know five ten percent um mm-hmm. the only limitation is the sheer number of pellets in there and if you're a good shot it does take one golden bb to drop most birds if you're a bad shot like me maybe i should adopt that 10 gauge three and a half inch strategy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah not in it for the meat <laughs> no 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 no. We've, we've all been there so yeah so hope that helps you know it, it's 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 kind of wishy-washy but that's how we are and that's how i shoot so uh, you know you, uh, the best thing you can do is practice you know and um and that that's something none of us do near enough of yeah agreed no matter what gun you have if you learn to shoot it well yeah yeah, it's yeah, it's like I've always, uh, in fact, the guy who taught me to shoot best, and I'm going back to his methods right now, Buzz Fawcett. Originally, we met because I taught him how to fish weighted nymphs under a strike indicator way back when, when they were fashionable and new. And uh, and I told him the same thing. You know, uh, he says, why do you always use that gold rib hairs here? And I said, because I'm, I have confidence in it. I can put that fly anywhere and know that I might catch a fish and it's the same with your gun. It's the same with your ammo. It's the same with your shooting style. Um, you got to have confidence in it and it's all, it's a head game. Yeah. Yes, it is. A lot of it is. So there anyway. So, um, good. I think we're down to, um, number six or something right in, right in there aren't we <laughs> uh seven i believe okay go, go ahead <laughs> okay um let's see how do you feel about um if you're a first-time dog owner learning to train your dog besides you know reading some of the many good books out there on different techniques you know there's there's a ton of books out there right now for people to learn from but do you think for the first time dog owner it's beneficial to enlist the help of a professional trainer yes if you find one that you know and respect and that has a good reputation how can you lose Uh, ideally the person you bought the dog from should help a little bit whether they're just breeders or their breeder trainers uh, you should expect some of that kind of assistance and they should be your go-to for all the dumb questions 
I mean, and, and we all have a lot of them, especially if it's a first puppy for somebody. It, it could be anything from uh, wh- why they're always waking up in the middle of the night uh, on down the list. And we all have that list. Um, a good, experienced, well-regarded trainer that works with dogs of your style. I don't say breed because a great short hair trainer can probably train any pointing breed and vice versa um, is is the way to go if you're looking for somebody for help. But I also believe that the best trainer will be the guy who lives with that dog 24-7. So um, sending a dog off to school for three months or six months or worse um, probably will turn out a pretty good dog. But you're missing out on all the fun. Uh, it's frustrating, yes, but it's also gratifying to train a dog yourself. Like, again, pardon the pun, but the first TV show I ever made was about fly fishing. There's nothing like catching a trout on a fly you tied yourself. And it's the same for training dogs. I think there's nothing like watching that dog slam his first point and then you harvesting a bird over that point it's it it, you can't describe it i'm getting the hair standing up on the back of my neck just (laughs) thinking about it so um big and and part of that is the dog is learning constantly every day in every way they're they're looking at you they're looking at other people they're looking at other dogs they're looking at the birds in the backyard at the feeder and they're learning all the time so you are ideal to be the guy teaching the whole time and so bear that in mind you your dog at the trainer is going to get a half hour of contact and training help a day maybe an hour plus some exercise we hope but the rest of the time they're sitting around looking at the other dogs in the kennel trying to figure out how to get out of the kennel trying to figure out when dinner is going to be there i'd rather have that dog learning all the time and there's only one guy that can do that and that's the owner Great. One thing I have found helpful, um, you know, I I definitely, if I run into a tough spot or something, I'm having a hard time getting through. A lot of times my my trainer, Rich, he will have me bring the dog down for the day and just go through the rough area and show me and come up with a game plan. You know, here's what you need to do for the next two weeks with them to get them where you want them to be. And yeah, I think that's a lot more effective than dropping the dog off. You know, you I'm, thank you for bringing that up. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, we all always talk about, oh, man, training is so expensive. Yeah, you know, so is uh, doing your taxes yourself if you make a big mistake. So, um, yeah, go to the pros and consult them. There, I, I don't know many pro trainers who won't free up an hour or two of their day for the right price there are they are making a living at this so expect to pay for this Mm. Uh, who wouldn't give you some tips and if somebody says no i'm not going to work with you unless you commit to three months and your dog is here the whole time you might want to wonder about that person no and i'm not saying it's it's the only way to do it i'm not saying it's my way or the highway but there there ought to be someone out there who can help you with that stuff uh, yeah, and, and and maybe is available by phone too. You know, especially if you already have a relationship with them. So, uh, right, yeah, it doesn't have to be a full time, long term commitment. Uh, and and you know, there are a lot of guys out there, and God bless them, they'll offer a little class every Saturday morning for anybody who wants to show up. Whether it's free or not is another question, but it's a good way to cover all that stuff. In you know in a regular regularly scheduled situation Mm -hmm. plus like you said once you get to know them you do have that relationship to just call them on the phone and say hey this is what he's doing yeah what should i do (laughs) yeah and and you know i gotta tell you because you know the you know i still consult in in a number of categories including product design and things like that and you please be 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 considerate and understand that time is money when people are giving advice of any sort and there ought to be a quid pro quo so uh you know if it's appropriate it's a payment if it's not maybe it's a bottle of something old and brown from scotland at 
you know, at the end of the year. But, uh, you know, remember, it's a, you know, it's a tit for tat kind of situation. Agreed. Um, let's do uh, both of us a favor and my sponsors as well. Um, I'm going to let you uh, relax for a couple minutes, Wayne Harvat from Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. While Wayne is relaxing, we're going to have a little break where I can uh, start paying the bills. Yeah, and it's always good to talk about dog performance. That's Dr. Tim Hunt's world. Uh, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com is Dr. Tim's performance dog food. Had a great discussion with him not a week ago about the stuff that's important this time of year, stamina. If you're still hunting, your dog is, you know, basically running on fumes now. They're all the pent-up uh, energy that they've had over the season is pretty much gone and you're you need to manage that this time of year for all sorts of reasons so uh let me talk about one of the ingredients in dr tim's performance dog food that i didn't realize was so important ash content yeah if you're not reading the the all the nutritional information on your dog food bag drop everything pause the podcast and go look all right come back thank you all right what did you learn? Well, ash content is on there. Now, the key is low ash content. It's a critical nutrient, believe it or not, but a lower ash content signifies a higher grade of meat meal, more protein, less bone. Ash is necessary. It provides essential minerals, but it's got to be in the right proportion. Learn more about all of this stuff and how transparent Dr. Tim is about his ingredients and where they come from at drtims.com. 30% discount on your first order if you use the code Upland Nation. And one more plug. I was reminded again yesterday, nice to get a dog food bag that still weighs 40 pounds. So if you're comparing prices, make sure you're comparing apples to apples such as it is and uh my promise to you is 100 rounds a week for 10 weeks once the season's over i'm going to be shooting a lot of targets and esp electronic shooters protection is helping me with that was out last week working on it already by the way if anybody knows where i can find some target ammo please let me know learn more about esp at espamerica.com I am a big believer wearing them in the field now as well. They're comfortable. They don't fall out because they're custom fit. They help me from the uh, the perception of pain, which leads to flinching, especially when you're on round 96. 30-day money-back trial. Get fitted locally. Go to the dealer locator page and type in your address, and all of a sudden, you've got a nearby place to go to get custom fitted Learn more at ESPAmerica.com. The Handle It segment is sponsored by Happy Jack Dog Care Remedies. They've got something for your dog's skin coat, parasites, fleas, and ticks. Take a look at the whole gamut at happyjackinc.com. I was reminded again in a conversation with somebody a couple days ago. I think it was on that last hunt, actually. Eyes may be the window to our soul, but they're also the portal to your dog's understanding of commands. And I know Wayne and I were talking about commands and electronic collars, and that's one way to do it. But a dog is looking to you for all sorts of guidance. A lot of it is unsaid stuff, body language. So while your voice is given the command, his ears may be hearing it, but his eyes are searching. They want something. I don't know what it is, but they, they trust you. I'm convinced that a dog trusts you more when they can see your eyes. What does that mean? Well, when you're in the field, take off your dark glasses. Um, I've been shooting clear lenses in my shooting glasses for years and years. I'm, I'm going over to a kind of a, a light yellow for some other reasons I'll talk about someday. But... Uh, If the dog can see in your eyes, and and I've invited people to experiment with this over the years, and they've all said, yeah, I get it. Okay, yeah. 
There are other reasons as well, but if the dog can see your eyes, he's less likely to object to your commands. There's something deeper than that. I don't know what it is, but in the meanwhile, trust me on that one. Experiment for yourself. Good luck. All right, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Uh, Ten questions, so we're probably about halfway through. Wayne Harvat in Pennsylvania, welcome back to the program. Thank you. How am I doing so far? You're doing great. And so are you, by the way. Thank you for going to the trouble of uh, actually, I mean, living up to the homework assignment consulting others coming up with some great ones that i hope are being of uh, of use to everybody who's listening appreciate that um just out of curiosity what are your dogs doing right now they are all currently taking their mid-afternoon nap in their kennel <laughs> ah quiet time <laughs> yes yes uh, do you have i mean five is enough uh, two is enough at our house but one is enough if the right people are coming to the door but um, how do you settle them down when they all are uh, when they've all gotten the memo and decided it's time to bark? Usually, when it's time to bark, um, we have a pretty large fenced-in yard, mm-hmm. so um, usually, if they're getting that rambunctious, it means they want to go out and run. So we'll let them out to run and play in the yard and burn off some of that energy. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, the, the, we talked puppies earlier. One of the things that I learned in my, my with my first wire hair was if I got an obedience problem, he hasn't had enough exercise. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that is very true. Dogs definitely are much better in the house when they have that opportunity to exercise every day. Yeah. Do you road your dogs? Do you have a four by four or anything like that? No, no, we don't. Um, Generally, in the summer, we do a lot of swimming with them when it's warmer conditions. Yeah. I think swimming's a real good exercise for them. And then before the season, usually about a month or two before, I actually try and just take them and run them in similar conditions to what they'd experience in the field while going for a walk with them. So Sure, yeah. That seems to keep them in pretty good shape. Great. Good. Okay, so um, here at the Upland Nation podcast, uh, Wayne, uh, we're up to, uh, I don't know, we're probably at question number five or six by now. Uh, Let's see. Actually, I think we're at number eight. (laughs) Oh, oh my God. Okay. Well, good. (laughs) Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Um, And I know this is something you do recommend, but just sort of would want to point out for new people coming into the field because I certainly never thought of it when I was first getting involved in bird dogs or didn't carry it is the importance of carrying a first aid kit. Um, yeah. What, what are some of the things even just for a basic first aid kit that you think a hunter should carry in the field? Okay. Um, both of these are at, uh, my website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. So if you want the whole list, because I'm sure I'll forget something, Uh-oh. go there, findbirdhuntingspots.com, and then click on the one that says uh, your dog or something like that. Um, so, Wayne, are we are we talking about the one for our dogs or the one for our humans? Uh, for the dogs. Okay. So always a good idea to have a human one along yeah. as well. Well, I carry, I carry a kit... I joke that if I cannot see my truck, this is in my pack, my pocket, my vest, whatever I'm, I am dragging around, even if it's just a fun run for the dog somewhere. Um, and most of this stuff you can use on yourself as well, but it's not near as comprehensive a kit as I keep in the truck for later. Um, so my goal of the invest kit, is to basically fix anything so that I can get back to the truck and go to the veterinarian. So here are the things that come to mind. Duct tape for a whole bunch of reasons. I could do a whole podcast on duct tape. Um, (laughs) From a dog boot to a bandage. I carry uh, Q-tips 
uh, primarily to get crap out of a dog's eye. Um, I carry distilled water in a little squirt bottle for the same reason and also to clean uh, uh, wounds, to rinse out wounds. Uh, a lot of people like saline solution, like contact lens solution, but the, all the pro medical types that I talk to like distilled water better than saline, even for the eyes. Um, I carry uh, hemostat, uh, forceps, another word for it, for pulling stuff out, you know, porcupine quills or, or anything else. I don't stick it in a dog's eye or I don't stick it in a dog's ear. There's just too much risk in both of those. Um, let's see what else I carry, um, a little bit of antiseptic, uh, ointment. I do not carry a stapler, a surgical stapler, because most times I don't want to close a wound. I haven't been able to clean it well enough to do that but I'll disinfect it, I'll put the antibiotic on, and then I'll cover it in one way or another. I do carry some veterinary uh, medical uh, super glue just in case. There are very few times when I might use it, but I do carry it. Uh, and, and, uh, and I always have a bandana around my neck of one sort or another, so I always have another way to uh, hold a bandage somewhere if I need it. Um, and for the same reason, I'll carry a roll of gauze and uh, some uh, various sorts of, we call it vet wrap, the generic version of that. But uh, And actually, I just had a blood test yesterday. I want to give everybody a trick when using vet wrap because this will drive me nuts. And for some reason, it always doesn't work. You finish all that vet wrap and you always wrap it looser than you think you should. This uh, phlebotomist who took my blood, I said, why do you why do you wrap it around, wrap it around, and then double back the last wrap? And she said, so that you have something to grab onto and peel back real easily. Because if you've dealt with vet wrap that's been on for a half a day or a day, it's hard to kind of get it started to remove it again. Double back a couple inches, and you got this big wad of vet wrap that you can grab with your finger. I think that's about it it in my kit I'm, I'm visualizing anything else that might be in there and i can't how about you wayne uh i think the only thing i i mean all good ones you mentioned definitely stuff i carry but um i, I usually carry quick stop as well yes thank you and so do i you're right tell everybody what that is a uh, quick stop's basically um medical grade uh it, it, it's almost like similar to baking soda or baking powder mm -hmm. in what it does um it's real good for ears you know dogs tend to bleed the worst from their ears it seems like even with a small cut um you know looks like the dog you know has this huge bloodbath coming from his ear but um with the quick stop if you apply it and put it on the wound it helps dry that up and make it clot faster yeah so yeah. that bleeding goes away Yep. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm visualizing the picture in a magazine article I wrote. I was lucky enough to early on, and this may be the only good thing to come out of, I think the Vietnam war. And that is there's a gauze version of that, that I carry. You just slap that on the wound and it, it just, it just stops the bleeding completely. And if it doesn't slap another version on and so right. on and so forth. So, right. Yeah, that's good. All right, good. Um, uh, Upland Nation, question number nine. nine. Okay. Um, I get this a lot and see this a lot in people in the field, especially new people that I might have hunting with us, my wife and I, Tracy, mm -hmm. that um, what's the best way to walk in on a dog that's on point so as not to break his focus? Yeah, I love that question, and uh, and I've experimented a lot with it, and not just my own dogs, but other people's dogs, and and the best. Let let me use a highfalutin word for a moment here: a lilometric, a lilometric behavior. Look it up. I I think I pronounced it correctly. I can never spell it when I type it, but what it is is it's you watch a school of fish and they all flank together, or a flock of birds and they're flying straight and then all of a sudden somebody sends out the memo and they all turn right 
<laughs> or two horses or two wolves on National Geographic TV that are basically trotting in unison. That's what that is. And if we walk from behind our dog straight past him, close by, into the bird, the dog's initial inclination is to catch up with us. We've all seen it happen and because, of course, that's called heel. So um, whether you teach heel or not, or that's the word, is immaterial, but the dog is inclined naturally, instinctively to want to follow along. So the first thing we can do, if we have the luxury of the time to do it, is to get away from there. Um, anywhere else is a good idea. So if you're behind your dog and you see that dog go on point, and I don't mean right behind, you could be anywhere in the field. I'm thinking about a, a wild flush on a chucker last weekend, uh, two weekends ago. Anyway, um, I I tried to get way wide to one side and and for chuckers i try to get downhill so that it's a better shot for me um and so if at the minimum you can get to one side or the other and move in great because one of the other things you're trying to do and again bob ferris in uh boise idaho thank you for this that also does another thing it it shows the dog that you are on the scene and ideally, that means you're in control, and by then you've taught your dog that what, when he's on point and you're in the picture, it's an implied whoa. So the dog knows you're there. The dog knows you're in control. The dog knows, okay, we're all here. Um, he, he never said a thing, or maybe he did. I am not going to flush that bird. Swing wide. If there's two of you, swing wide from different directions as long as you're safe. Don't be shooting at each other. Uh, if you can and you have the luxury of a cooperative bird or a cooperative covey, swing all the way around and come in towards the dog because then you've cut off two escape routes for running birds. And they're more likely to go up than out. There's my thoughts. Okay. Yeah, that that is my thinking as well i definitely prefer to come in towards the front of the dog uh one like you said to keep it from running and to to make it go more up than just straight out so yeah it doesn't work <laughs> 50 50 shot <laughs> yeah you know the best laid plans of mice and men and all that you know all we can do is try <laughs> and actually if if the dogs will cut us some slack we're going to cut them some slack too because you know there are some times when you actually want that dog to fly the bird for you I, i'll never forget i was uh i was hunting in south dakota with with um a, a woman outfitter lodge owner who judged german breeds in germany so she was like on the a-list and we were hunting hungarian partridge next to sunflowers in you know crp and 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 the they those birds were running everywhere they were not cooperating pretty soon the dogs figured all that out and decided yeah yeah we're just gonna flush them for you and and i said well what about you know she said the 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 goal of the dog is to put birds in the air for the gun so, you know, there's another skill involved in all that. You want a dog to only rush in slowly <laughs> and right. within gun range. But, but I mean, think about it. There, We've all been there. Um, I never send my dogs in on anything I can't see because then they might flush a porcupine, and that never ends up being fun for either of us. But if, if I see a running covey and I'm in gun range and, and the dog's going crazy, I, I might tolerate that. Well, you know what? It's funny you mentioned that because that fits right in with the French Brittany world, the Epineal Breton, that one of the things that they are actually trained to do and um, is looked at even in, in when they do the trials. Yeah. It's yeah. called the coulé. Yeah. Yeah. I learned that from Jackie, by the way, You're our oh, mutual you? friend. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And, and explain to us what that, uh, yeah, I don't know what the real, tr the, the, the literal translation is, but describe that to us, Wayne. Well, basically it, it's just your dog goes on point. The bird, by the time you get there, the bird might not be right in front of them, might have moved on slightly um, or even moved on, you know, 50 yards that you're able to tap that dog on the head and have him go slightly out in front of you and work to resenting and either repointing the bird mm -hmm. or producing the bird for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to give you one perfect example of this and it cost us a bird. Uh, we were chucker hunting a couple weekends ago at a, at a place that I'd never been before. And by the way, thank you, Tom, for showing that place to me. I'd driven by it a thousand times. He shot a bird. He shot two birds, which makes me really mad because I didn't have a shot and he dropped them both, but one landed soft and and we know what that means so i sent flick and he went straight to the first bird brought it right back nobody's finding that second bird we kind of marked it pretty well though so i sent flick down into that little gully and he slammed into a point and at that time if i had been smart i would have thought okay i know these birds pretty well if they're if they got an ounce of life left in them they're not going to stick around for a pointing dog who found him again so I should have said Kool-Aid because eventually I did say fetch. And by then that bird was out of there and Flick was doing a ground track. And by the time he tracked that bird, it was, it flew again. So all of a sudden we had nothing for the, for all that effort. Right. And that that's a tough situation because sometimes when you don't know how well the birds hit, whether it's capable of flying yet, whether you're, you know, you want the dog to repoint it so you can kick it out again, or whether you want that dog, like you said, just the fetch command, chase it down on the ground and bring it back for you. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's always a judgment call. And, and if, if I'm judging, it's always wrong. So, <laughs> so there's Kool-Aid and, and there's, um, there's something you might want to add to your quiver of, tactics down the road right and agreed especially here in pennsylvania with the stock birds yeah yeah that that works really well um when you get in those situations with a lot of running birds yeah great okay well are we down to the last one we are okay um, let's let's do it <laughs> this this one's sort of a fun one it's uh, a debate between my wife tracy and i on <laughs> oh great <laughs> yeah so you could get in trouble on this one <laughs> um it is what's your opinion of teaching a pointing dog the set command you know i don't do it because um because i've i've, I've, I've the first dog i ever had the first wire hair i ever had um was all whatever he was confused he would sit down and look to me and I was flattered that he thought I might be able to help him. But, but the sit down part of that is something I didn't want to risk. And I've seen it happen in many other dogs over many hunts, uh, many generations of dogs and not just my own. There's always a risk there. Now, if your dog is a really staunch pointer and, and doesn't have an ounce of indecision in his DNA, um, getting them to sit is probably not a bad idea. You got to think about why you want a dog to sit. And is there something else you can ask it to do instead? And, you know, the first thing that come to mind is, is in a duck blind, uh, or, uh, on a, on the table at a veterinarian's office or on your own table when you're trying to pull something out of his eye or something like that. Um, Otherwise, you're just showing off. It's just another command, and, and you can use other commands to get your dog to stand still. The first one being whoa. Um, a lot of NAVDA guys believe in uh, down, so your dog is literally and physically uh, immobilized to a greater degree. Um, 
that that's generally my thought on it right there now if like i said if you got a dog you have a lot of confidence in and he has a lot of confidence and he's a staunch pointer um doesn't show any other times when he's considering sitting down on the job yeah go ahead and and guys do it people do it every day uh interestingly just off the top of my head, the people I remember who do it are all kind of like your wife. They're females. Huh. Interesting. I, I'm sure that's just coincidence. But, Could you know, be. that's a good... Okay, if you're listening out there, go to the Facebook page. Tell us, do you teach your pointing dog to sit? I'm really interested. And, and Wayne, what, what did you two decide? Um... <laughs> You know, over the course of our seven years of having Laurel Furnace Bretons, I think that um, we, we go back and forth on it. And a lot, like you said, does depend on the dog. If, if they're showing signs that they're dropping their back end when they're on point or crouching down too much, then, you know, we're generally not going to encourage them to set. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, again, you know, if, if, if you're watching your dog carefully in the field, especially on now, uh, um, hinky birds, uh, that dog's going to show you whether it wants to sit down or not. Uh, and again, if it's, if it's a little doubtful about something, whether he's doing the right thing, where he's, if, if he's fearful in one way or another, then all of a sudden you, you know, you might run that risk. Right. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I've learned something. Uh, Wayne, I appreciate your being the, the guinea pig on this whole 10 questions exercise at the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, uh, anything you want to contribute for the good of the order? I mean, you're a breeder, you're a trainer, you're a hunter. Tell us something that we don't know. The most fun part of the dog is building that bond with them once you have that bond and you get them out in the field it's just a wonderful experience for you so uh, i mean that's the greatest part of hunting it isn't how many birds you shoot or um how many points you get in the day but just that experience when you're out with your dog having fun like you said having fun yeah i couldn't say it better wayne harvat It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for being a part of the Upland Nation. The whole Upland Nation has lots more to learn. We're going to cover a a place to hunt, uh, especially late season. I'm going to share our listener poll with you. How many dogs do you own? It's all coming up here on the Upland Nation podcast. Wayne Harvat, thank you. I hope what's left of your season goes well. And thanks again for being on the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you, Scott. And, of course, a quick reminder that the Upland Nation is brought to you in part by Gunner Kennels. Oh, they're just going by Gunner.com these days because they have so many other things from apparel to accessories. But a quick reminder that Gunner Kennels have been tested and proven to save actual dogs in actual accidents. Take a look at all the stories at Gunner.com. Then remember the free shipping Be the first to know about early offers, exclusive offers. Get early access on them by signing up for their mailing list. Watch the videos, take the Fit Finder quiz. Learn more about them at gunner.com. So, the Upland Nation index is my annual survey i don't know 30 or so questions and thank you if you answered them or most of them appreciate that gives me some insights which i share with you it also helps us find sponsors which means i can share more information from you so uh, if you haven't taken it yet there's still time just go to the link on the facebook page and do that for me and you'll be entered to win that Mossberg Silver Reserve over and under shotgun. One of the questions I ask is more for fun and curiosity than anything else. Uh, How many dogs do you own? 
fascinating results. Uh, about 35% of us own one dog. Interestingly low, 41% of us own two or three dogs, and 16% of us own four or more dogs. I hope you have a, uh, I hope you have help with your feed bill, but um, that's a that's a fun one right there. Yeah, where do you fit in? Uh, maybe you have 11 or like Wayne, five. <laughs> Probably working on six right about now. So anyway, all right. So um, lots to learn from that, and I'll do my best to share some of that as we go. But in the meanwhile, let's talk public ground. This Land is Your Land is brought to you by my website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. That's what it's all about. New material every week to help you find places to hunt. Some training advice and care for your dog. It's all there at findbirdhuntingspots.com. One of our listeners, Brandon Murphy, asked me a question that I thought would be worth sharing with you. Brandon says he's planning a late season hunt to Kansas on public ground. Well, luckily, um, late season in Kansas is later than a lot of places. Being further south, the weather is better longer down there. So a late November, early December hunt like Brandon, you're planning to do is, uh, is very realistic. And I've done that and had a good time. So Brandon asks, where should I start? Well, the first thing you want to do is go to, uh, let's see, huntks.com, I think is their website. Uh, learn all about all the usual stuff, plus have access to their online version of their hunting atlas. Find the atlas, find the areas that I'm going to talk about, and start poking around for um, public access ground, uh, walk-in ground out there. That's what there's it's called, walk-in hunting access. Weehaw! which sounds a lot like Yeehaw, which fits in with one of the places I'd suggest you go, Dodge City, Kansas. All the comforts of home and a casino, some great history, and also lots of publicly accessible ground around Dodge City. Two of my other favorite spots, Osborne, Kansas, where the community says, Welcome, hunters. Again, lots of great publicly accessible private ground. You've seen my television shows on all three of these places. Just get another look at YouTube or on Amazon Prime video and get a taste for them all, Brandon and everybody else. And then Jetmore, one of my favorite places is um, Horse Thief Reservoir near Jetmore, Kansas. Beautiful place, all sorts of lodging opportunities in all three of those communities. These people love having you there. Brandon, that's where I'd go if I was forced to, but you don't have to force me to go to any place in Kansas. Good luck and keep us posted. The Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by ESPAmerica.com, custom-fitted electronic earplugs. I use them at the range, and I also use them in the field. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned as much as I did. Thank you, Wayne Harvat, for asking the 10 questions. If any of you want to do that, cook up 10 or 9 or 11. I'm okay with that. And then private message me at the Wing Shooting USA or the Upland Nation Facebook pages, and we'll work on that for an upcoming podcast. Do me a big favor. Rate the podcast at Apple Podcasts. That's the one that really counts. Appreciate that. Thank you, Roz Wu and Flyline, for your kind words in that format. I'm heading out again today. I'll have lots of stories coming up on the next Upland Nation podcast. I hope you will, too. Be safe out there. I'll leave you with this quote from President Woodrow Wilson. He says, if a dog will not come to you after having looked you in the face, you should go home and examine your conscience. Yeah, so true, Mr. President. Thanks again for listening. 
I hope you have a great day, week, season, life, all of the above. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening.